This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host David Holloway and it's great as always to be here with you. Uh, It's a pleasure today to have Lockie Dolly on the show. Lockie has had one hell of a career already and he's only getting started. If you love seeing some great organ or clav playing then you'll probably know Lockie's work very well already. If not, have a listen to Lockie's story on his impressive solo work, his current work with the Lockie Dolly Group, and also some great reflections on his successful history as a sideman for greats such as Jimmy Barnes and Billy Thorpe, to name just two. Enjoy the interview. Lockie, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Dave. Thanks for having me. So, I actually forgot to ask you before we started recording, are you a Queenslander? I haven't worked out what state you're in. What? What do you mean, Queensland? No, I am uh, live in Sydney, but actually originally from Adelaide. That's where I grew oh, up. Oh, jeez, I couldn't have got that more wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. We're not far away at all. Um and I do need to put a language warning out to our listeners. Um, like you, I quite often get feedback from some of our US listeners that they have enough trouble understanding me. So when you've got two Aussies on, um, it can get a bit challenging. <laughs> yeah, I, I presume so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, again, thanks for joining us. So I, I just wanted to kick off, obviously, um, over the last few episodes, I've been asking how people have been surviving um, the the lockdown or a bit of a bit of isolation. I noticed that you started keeping busy just at the very beginning of isolation, in that you made a cool little video clip with your family. But how, how have you been keeping busy over the last couple of months? Well, it's been a pretty crazy transition. I was halfway through a uh, a tour around Australia um, when it all when it all got shut down. So I think we had like six or or more shows left, and then it was like. Oh, it's all over. Um, so it was pretty, um, it was pretty swift and yeah, uh, I didn't quite know how to take it at the start. I was a bit freaked out, but, um, no, I thought I've sort of come to a good place now and I'm, you know, it's given me a lot of time to reevaluate like it has probably a lot of people when, um, and sort of, uh, you know, change direction in some way, at least for the for the meantime, and in, in being creative and, and working on my projects, and also helping a lot of other people too. You know, doing a lot of teaching, doing a lot of online lessons, which has been great. You know, and I've had a lot of people sort of asking me to do that over the years, so I, I sort of finally got got that together, and and uh, I'm really enjoying that. And got a lot of cool students, sort of from all around the globe. <laughs> That's and then doing sessions as well, you know. I'm, I'm playing on lots of people's music, which is really fascinating, and and it's kind of feeding my creative energy as well. And yeah, so there's lots of. I'm actually in a really, really sort of good spot at the moment, um, as far as just feeling optimistic and um, and you know and and feeling like I'm I'm having fun, sort of making music again, and that's kind of seems to be the the focus at the moment is sort of being creative and writing and and teaching and the, the live things just yeah well 
I'm just not even trying to think about it at the moment. <laughs> yeah, a good approach. And, and I would have been surprised if you'd said you were just sitting back bored. So, yeah, I'm not super surprised that you've been busy. To, to kick yeah. off, um, just a bit of a potted history about Lockie Dolly, the, the, the youth. So how, how did you start out in music? You know, what, what got you into it and, and what got you to a career in it? We had a piano at home. We had an upright piano at home um, in Adelaide. And um, just with my mum, she's a single, a single mum. But, um, yeah, she start, basically started going out with this, this kind of pot-smoking kind of, I guess you could say, hippie, alternative character, blues guitar player called, called Baz. And um, <laughs> he introduced myself and my brother, who's also a great keyboard player, uh, into into the blues, you know, he'd he'd jam on his guitar just during the day, and he'd play records by John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and and Willie Dixon, and collect all these videos, these VHS videos that he he'd find, and um, yes, yeah, so that that was our introduction to to music in well anything other than what was on the radio anyway, and and um, just sort of jamming along with him, trying to trying to imitate those piano players on those records like Otis Spann and Pinetop Perkins and, and uh, legends like that. That's kind of the, the, where it first began. And then, then from there, it, you know, I discovered the Hammond organ, um, just a, you know, an awesome, most incredible sound sounding thing. You know, I think I was very lucky that my first experience of a Hammond or, or any kind of organ was was actually getting my fingertips on a on a real one, a real Hammond and Leslie. And so, I think that kind of set the tone. You know, all the drawbars out, up full, crankingly loud, and and was like, whoa, what is this sound? This is amazing. All I have to do is hold my note, my finger down on this note for as long as I want, and it just keeps screaming. <laughs> And how how did you get that first? How did you get that first experience? Like, what what was the the situation where you laid hands on one? Well, uh, this uh, this guitar player called Brian Morrison in Adelaide, um, he actually had a bit of a fascination with the, the Hammond organ. He had a band called Double Whammy, and um, and Clayton actually started playing. He's my older brother. He actually started playing with those guys, and and he'd play on their Hammond. So we had the Hammond at home and then, you know, Clay's like, oh, you got to check this out. Yeah. And then so, so I was lucky enough to just, just basically have it in the, in the garage for a week wow. and um, turn it on and fire it up and go crazy for a while. <laughs> That's amazing. And so I'm assuming there yeah. was, was those experiences with, with the um, Clayton's um, band experiences that got you into the scene? Yeah. 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 Uh, so with that, Clayton played with that man for a few years and then I did a couple of gigs with them and then Clay moved to Sydney when he was about 10 and then I started, then I moved on and started playing with a band called, like a cover band called the Blues Brothers and Sisters of Soul, which was perfect because, you know, I, I love the Blues Brothers movie. Mm. That was one of the, another one of the things that Baz had sort of, um, introduced me to and so it was a perfect sort of cover band for me to be in for and I did that for a couple of years and then I then moved to Sydney as well and so that's yeah obviously and once you're in the Sydney scene bigger scene um get, getting regular work I assume so and how did you then take that step from arriving in Sydney to getting some of the more professional gigs that came up for you yeah so uh, I was in Sydney for what was it? Uh, well, I think it was a, a couple of years before I landed the gig with with Jimmy. And yet again, it was sort of um, Clayton kind of paved the way as far as, as far as that kind of stuff goes. So, so I, I came up when he started playing with Jimmy and I started, then he needed someone to fill in for the Mighty Reapers. So I came up for a month and started doing that. And then I was always planning to go back to Adelaide, but yeah, I loved it so much. I stayed, and then Clay moved to New York for about a year and a bit, and that's when I started playing with Jimmy. And then from there, I started playing with Billy Thorpe, and then um, then doing sessions for 
for Powderfinger and, and it all just sort of started to escalate from there and then started sort of, you know, um, veering off like with Powderfinger and various other people doing um, a whole bunch of other session stuff. And, yeah, and then since then it's been it's been sort of out on my own really and That's but right. still keeping my foot in you know keeping my foot in the water with playing with other people <laughs> That's right and I do I as I said um I want to focus on your career mostly but I do want to take a side step into um that that session work so Jimmy for for our non-Australian listeners is Jimmy Barnes and and he literally doesn't need to be called anything other than Jimmy within Australia um so that that obviously would have been a hell of a le- learning experience. Um, what 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 are your recollections of those early days playing with him, and and compared to what you'd learnt to date, what what you picked up? Well, I don't think I was anywhere near ready, or or certainly hadn't paid my dues enough to land a gig um, with Jimmy Barnes back then. You know, the biggest Australian rock, you know, rock artist here in Australia, and. Um, so he was quite an intimidating fellow. I mean, he still is, but mm. especially when you're a when you're a little twenty year old, sort of young and fresh on the scene, and you all of a sudden, you know, you've got people setting up your gear, and and you and uh, you know, you're doing these big gigs, and and um, there's these giant sort of anthems that he has, you know, these <laughs> piano anthems that that um, you know, as soon as you play like two notes, the crowd knows exactly what song it is, and they erupt, and it's like whoa. So the pressure was the pressure was quite insane, um, and I laugh about it now because I, I I don't feel any any pressure at all, you know, when I'm doing those songs these days. But those that sort of first six months of playing with him, it was just like I'd look at the set list and I could see those songs, you know, itching <laughs> closer to, and my anxiety levels were like slowly getting, you know, yeah. <laughs> heightened as we moved along the set, you know, because they'll always last, you know, they'll always near the end. I just wish they were like first and you could get it over and done with. But, yeah, um, you raise a good point because Jim, Jimmy's not necessarily known as being a, a keyboard driven artist, but you're right. Some of his biggest songs require you sitting there on your own doing intro. So I'm assuming you're talking things about obviously K-San's the obvious one, but working class man, stuff like that. So you're it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just vocal, vocal and piano. A lot, a lot of it's just even piano at the at the top, and it's like everyone knows every single note, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, and um, and Jimmy wasn't particularly forgiving back in those days. But but luckily, I uh, I think I only I only messed it up sort of half once. I remember once in Germany, I I sort of fluffed it, and he looked over at me and gave and like pointed his finger at me like he was shooting me. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, luckily, it wasn't like I kept it wasn't a train wreck or anything. I think I just uh, missed a chord or something like that. But um, I'll never forget that. I never did it again though. Okay. Um, yeah. So that was you know that was pretty funny. And I, I even remember the first gig that I did with him. And one of those intros, he had like a string. We had a, a string sampler that was you know to be played at the same time in the background. And it was this emu sampler and oh, thing from the I think it was probably even pretty old man. I think it was probably sort of from the mid eighties. And, um, you know, I remember it had like patch one, 132 was the string sound or something like that. <laughs> and we got to working class man and, uh, just about to do the intro intro. And I look over at the, uh, the string patch cause I had to turn the volume up and the whole thing had reset. And it was like on, I don't know, some, some default oh, no. weird ass sound. And I'm like, shit. All right. So I'm rushing out. I've got had a big dial on it, so I'm, I'm flicking through the <laughs> dial, just, you know. And the whole time, you know, there's just dead, dead silence going on. Everyone's just looking at me, waiting to start this intro. And uh, finally, and then like I finally get up to about eighty or something, and I'm still dialing this thing. And then um, I'll you you might have to beat this out, but uh, Jimmy just turns over to me and he goes, "Just play that." Fucking song! <laughs> and I was like, and I'm this like twenty, you know, this little twenty twenty year old kid just freaking out. Oh, all right, <laughs> don't worry. Just turn the volume down. Just play it on piano. And don't worry about the strings. But um, yeah, so that was my that was my very first gig with 
with Jimmy. Oh, that was your very first <laughs> and one. I, I played it, man. I just remember that was the first one, yeah. And I remember looking over at Yak, the drummer, and he was just laughing his head <laughs> off. And oh. I was like, oh. That, that is gold. And, and yeah. Lockie, we usually ask each guest for a train wreck scenario on stage, and I think you've just provided one of the best ones already. Um, and again, for <laughs> people that don't know Jimmy Barnes, he, he's an expat Scotsman who spent basically most of his childhood and obviously all his adulthood in Australia. And he's he's a true band leader and, yeah, not someone to be stuffed around with. So I can just imagine uh, what that was like as a young bloke. <laughs> That's yeah, it was it was pretty it was pretty wild. Just the the whole thing in general, like the band was wild, Jimmy was wild, um, and I just had no idea what I was what I was in for, um, you know. But it was what a schooling. I mean, really amazing to to be able to to play with those guys of that caliber as well, and and just you know the amount I learned about everything, just life and music and and being professional as well. And, you know, it was pretty amazing and definitely set the tone for the for the next 10 years. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. Sure. And I, I know one of the videos that stands out for me is in 2014, you obviously were still playing um, some g- gigs with Jimmy, Jimmy when he was supporting um, Springsteen and the E Street Band. Now, I'm a bit of a rabid Springsteen fan, so I can't avoid asking you, um, a, what it was like playing that support slot, and did you get within a hundred meters of um, either Roy or Charlie on E Street? Um, so, yeah, I mean that was that was amazing. Those gigs were incredible. I think we did two in we did two in Auckland and two at Hanging Rock in yeah. in uh, I think it's regional regional Victoria. Or yeah, is it I'm is. Sure. Victoria. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, no, I. I who did I meet? I, I I did briefly meet Bruce. I just shook his hand at kind of like the um at a little after after tour gathering in Auckland, which you know, he was you know just a, a true gentleman. But I was you know I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to just hang out and annoy him. So I, I just said hello and you know and thanks for having us and and all that kind of stuff and yeah moved on. But he was lovely. And it was interesting more interesting sort of talking to uh, his crew and, and stuff and just hearing about how generous he is and how, how great he treats all the people that he has working for him, which I just thought was quite fascinating. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. All the, every, everyone just loves him, loves him to bits. He's really created a, an incredible, um, I guess, um, team, massive team for himself and they just adore him. So um, yeah, it was just really uh, it was great to it was great to see that and see that in action, you know. And and everyone that we went, met on the crew was just a champion, you know. They were more than happy to show you everything and all the gear that everyone's using. And and um, yeah, so I got to meet Bruce and then I did a little bit of work with um, little Stevie on a track with Jimmy as well around the same time. So that was that was cool to hang out with him and have him sort of uh, producing a tune that was great fun <laughs> and was that uh, uh was that a re-recording of ride the night away or something different it was that one yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah i think it was when uh, actually i can't remember it must have been about six years ago or something like that i'd say like yeah that. that's right yeah no excellent i just yeah, i did want to sidestep into that because i imagine that was a bit of a a great experience. So, I mean, you, you're doing the session work. Um, I said you're playing with with Barnsey, um, Billy Thorpe. I, I could do another whole episode on with you. I, I mean, do you have any particular memories of playing with with Billy? Oh, I've got lots of memories of playing with Billy. I, I absolutely adored Billy Thorpe. Like, I think uh, he was so amazing to me. He just treated me like I don't know, just. He just treated me great, you know. He always, he, I, I really felt this sense of belief that he had, you know, in me, um, which uh, I hadn't sort of found from, I don't think any of those those big artists that I've worked with, you know, a real like kind of, like he just really loved what I did and then, and would always give me moments in the show to, to um, you know, to do what I do and what kind of, makes me unique i think you know with 
which was very different from playing with all the other people I'd played with. You know, it was very much sort of song based, and um, it was you know the the big band and everyone had their parts and their their you know their little solo. But Billy was. Billy was just, you know, he was he was from the '60s, you know. He was he was jamming, you know. It was turn it up and and let's make music and let's have fun and and let's just let's let's make something out of this, you know. Of course, he he had his songs, his big songs in Australia that that he played, but he still jammed them out, you know. And and if he had people in his band, you know, he knew what they were capable of. He he knew that he could make the show better by showcasing, you know, like. It's incredible drama of Paul DeMarco, like unbelievable. Um, he'd have like a an, an epic, almost sort of um, Zep style drum solo in the show, and same with the bass. And then I'd get to do what I, you know, what what I did best, and then also play with those great musicians to try and, you know, sort of to just make it grow. And and yeah, so that was a whole another schooling again. And I just. I loved playing with Billy. The, the shows, the live shows with him were just electric. They and were the, unreal. And you, <laughs> you raise a fascinating point. So again, for Australian listeners, you, you know Billy Thorpe, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs and so on, and he, he had some huge hits. But I, I count myself as one that was ignorant in regards to him until I saw him live. And exactly what you said, Lockie, just the experience of watching a master of both his own instrument and voice, but also having a great band behind him. It, it was absolutely an unbelievable experience that I wasn't expecting. He was on a triple bill with America and Richard Clapton, and I, I've gone along for yeah. mostly Richard Clapton, probably, and a bit of America. I thought, oh, yeah, Billy Thorpe said it. Just, you know, he had those couple of hits and then was transformed by watching him. He was easily the best of the night. Oh, what a presence. He just, he just owned it. As soon as he got up there, it was just like, it was crazy. He just he just lived on stage. It's where he belonged. <laughs> it was unbelievable, and his voice, oh, amazing. And th- that that certainly it doesn't explain your own performance, but uh, uh, it would definitely inform the way you approach uh, performance. And and it's fair to say you you've got a very dynamic um, on on stage presence as well. So I mean, let's talk about you and and the way you approach your music. So. After all that great session work and doing all these things, what what launched you into doing your own stuff? What what was the impetus for it? Well, what really launched it was um, so just after sort of playing with Billy, I did a long stint with this other Australian band. Sorry about all the Australian bands, but um, Powderfinger and mm. they were quite different again. They were very very song based and lyrical based, and and uh, everything was particular. It was the exact opposite, and, and I found that very inspiring as well. And I did a long run with them, and they finished up in 2010. And uh, I just started sort of writing tunes and really trying to, you know, get into lyrics. I suppose I'd never really paid much attention to um, to uh, to lyrics, especially with with my originals, anyway. And uh, but playing with Powderfinger kind of really made me see how incredible and emotive they can be, and so I started writing all these songs that were, were more, I guess, more melodic and more lyrical, and um, I didn't know what to do with them. And I, th- I think this is the case with a lot of um, a lot of um, session musos who end up becoming their own artists. You know, they write these songs, and then it's like, well, I guess I'm just going to have to go out and do them myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I, I, I made it. I made an album with with all those tunes, and I still love that album. Um, uh, I'm really, really proud of it. Uh, and, uh, basically I thought, oh, well, I'm going to have to go and, I'm going to have to go and play them live now. So I, uh, got a band together and this is in, yeah, 2010, got a band together, a great band went out and basically just realized, man, I hate these songs. <laughs> these, these songs are not fun to play. They are not fun to sing. <laughs> and I realized, well, they just didn't, they didn't actually showcase anything that I was actually really good at. I was basically doing all this stuff that I was sort of okay at, but nothing I was really good at, <laughs> if that makes any sense to you. Yeah. Um, and it, it was a crazy awakening. So we're in the middle of this sort of very, very small and humble tour uh, for that album. And I was just like, oh, 
I don't want to play any more of these songs. Um, so I remember quite distinctively going uh, going back home and getting on the, the Hammond and going, right, I just want to write songs that I'm going to have a great time playing and actually I can sing well and uh, cater to my sort of blues sensibilities when it comes to, to singing and, um, and, and, you know, can really showcase what I can do on the organ and, and show all the kind of madness and all the sort of sweet things. And, you know, soloing's always been a big part of what I do. So why not make the solos part, uh, you know, features in the songs that have maybe movements or whatever, but, uh, but generally are quite free and open. So I really did. I really, from that point on, and all the albums on. Sure, there's there's some particular songs that are very that you know maybe uh, don't fall in this category. But as a whole, it was generally like I'm writing songs for what I want to do live, and you know what I feel comfortable and well, not totally comfortable. I'm still always trying to get myself out of the you know being too comfortable. Yeah, but yeah. what I think is going to be the best, you know rather than trying to do stuff that other people just do heaps better. <laughs> I guess it's just, it's just finding yourself, I suppose, and finding your voice, if you not sound too cliche. but and that, um, That's really fascinating, yeah, though, because I'm not aware, and it's just because I'm not aware of them, I'm not aware of any artist that would have that level of insight that they're writing for what they want to do live. Uh, in your case, obviously, it's stuff you'd like doing as well. But you, your initial album sounded like something you wanted to do artistically, but didn't translate uh, to being something you enjoyed doing live. So you, you've actually altered your approach based on that. Exactly. Yeah. And I still write songs, you know, in the vein of that first album, but they're just sitting. They're just sitting here, you know. Um, and sometimes I, you know, I, I, one day I might get other people to um, to sing them or do an album, and and probably never probably never perform them live, I don't think. Um, but, uh, yeah, because it's all, that's, that's what I've done all my life is play live. And, and that's why this time is so, so strange. Um, through the whole COVID thing. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's what I love to do. You know, that's what I've always loved to do. And if all of a sudden I'm on stage and I'm not loving it anymore because I'm having to play these songs that I don't think really, uh, really work for me then um yeah i just had to i just had to change and i'm so glad i did and and you know and as soon as i as soon as i did you know the, the reactions that i got back from from everywhere was, was just awesome you know it was, it was completely completely different to the first album you know it was and it, and especially in that kind of blues community even though i wouldn't i call myself a blues artist but i'm you know, that's really is just one part of, of mm. what I do. I mean, everything I think is grounded in the blues, but really it's, you know, what I play to blues traditionalists. They, you know, they roll their eyes at what I do. It's, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, the reaction in, in that community was, was, was just great, you know? And, 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 um, I just I just remember when I came out just receiving all these emails and emails and emails from all these radio presenters and stuff, just saying how much they, they loved it and they haven't heard anything like this with the Hammond out the front and this kind of 60s sort of sound and the blues for so long and it just took them back to all these these uh, these places. And, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget when that, that second album, SOS, came out. And, and, yeah, just the first time I started to get those kind of messages back, it was like... Oh, this is awesome! And definitely, definitely, you know, this was a good call and a good sort of move in the right direction. And and I've just tried to, I've just tried to sort of hone in on that over the last years. I've had a couple of experimental things that, you know, it's all you know that you do and you you learn from them too. That some of them work, some of them don't work, you know. But you try other things. But but um, that's definitely still, you know, I, I still think about the live show and what. You know, and what what's going to cater to my interesting and particular sort of skills that I have, and and my 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 kind of way my creative brain works, and what and just try and give that every chance of shining through in my writing. And but yeah, 
that, that's kind of <laughs> a bit long winded, no, but uh, that's, yeah, that's and, kind of what's but, going on there. And, and I actually want you to expand on that. So you've been far from long winded as far as um, you obviously had that change in approach. You're writing more for the live stuff and, and what excites you. How much did forming the Lockie Dolly group and the other guys that you play with um, assist in you evolving things along a bit? Uh, well, it's always been amazing. I've been so lucky to have such incredible musicians um, in Australia. I mean, really, it, it, absolutely world class, world class players down here, and and, um, and they're also humble. And um, yeah, I mean, right from the word go, I had an amazing bass player called Jan Bangma, who's a real, a real old soul when it comes to to bass playing. And, um, yeah, so he, I think he did all the gigs with me, at least probably like the first three years. I doubt he even missed a gig. And, um, it was amazing having him, who's, who, he's got some very strong opinions about what's good and bad. And, um, so it was really great to have him there to, um, to bounce ideas off and, and also, also, uh, keep me in check sometimes. <laughs> um, so he, he definitely played a bit, a, a big part in, um, in, in those early years, sort of helping to just, you know, for me to, to, to find the right path. And, um, yeah. And then great drummers as well. And Adam church, who just, just a really tasteful musical drummer. He sort of came from more of the rock back background, but seemed to just, just fit in really well with what I was doing and you can hear him on the SOS album and, and the conviction album. And, um, and he's just a sweet, a sweet guy and great drummer and very supportive. And yeah, so I was lucky to have that kind of team early on. And, and, uh, since then I've just, I've, it's been amazing playing with all the, the, the great players that we have here and then great players, around the world that I've had a chance to play with as well, you know, um, and they all, you learn something from all of them, you know, um, even if you, you've been playing the same song with, with one set of musicians and you go and play your song with another set of musicians and they've got a different take on it. And it's like, well, I haven't, I haven't thought about that song like that and I haven't heard it played like that. And, and, you know, it's, you just, I think it's great if, you know, the more people that you play with, you just, if you can take something away from that, it's always a, it's always a great thing. And, and I've been lucky, just blessed to play with great, great musicians. And what, what in, are some of the highlights Australia for and, you, Lockie? What are some of the highlights as far as other, whether it's other keyboard based players or other musicians that you play with that have really stood out for you? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, when I got the opportunity to play with, Glenn Hughes, that was that was an epic deal for me. Um, I sort of discovered Deep Purple probably late in the game because I was always, you know, I was always sort of more of a blues soul funk guy. But I had this attitude of playing the keyboard that reminded people of John Lord <laughs> and this kind of dirtier sound on the yeah. keyboard. And I wasn't really into John Lord. And um, uh, but people would always say, "Oh man, you sound just like John Lord." No, what do you mean? No, I don't. <laughs> um, and then from that, I I was like, oh, well, I'm going to um, I'm going to go check out this this purple thing, and and I started to you know there was a, just a, a stack of albums. They've done so many albums, so I found it a little bit overwhelming to start with. And then um, uh, another great bass player uh, in Australia called Dario Bortolin, who was playing on and off with Jimmy, he um. He he basically was playing me, you know. He started playing me more purple and and more um, and rainbow and stuff like that. And uh, I started to get into it a bit more. And um, I decided, oh, you know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to put a show together, which is called like featuring the Hammond organ. And I called it Hammond organ in rock. And I was just researching all these songs, and um, and I ended up putting like a whole bunch of purple, deep purple songs in there. And um, and started learning all these John Lord parts that I'd never learned before, and it just was like this awakening, like wow, this is amazing stuff. 
an incredible keyboard player from this classical background. And, um, uh, and, uh, just the way his, his musicality and his, and his like sort of just, uh, just the way he just owned the Hammond and knew every, every facet of it and could milk it for everything, you know, using every bit of it, you know, which, um, I always try and do because it's an incredibly expressive instrument. Um, so from there, I became a huge Deep Purple fan, John Lord fan. And then I found, you know, some of my favorite tunes were actually the later Purple songs, you know, with, um, with Glenn Hughes and Tommy Bowen and, okay. and, um, uh, so it was like Mark three and Mark four. And, uh, still with John Lord playing Hammond. So when I got a chance to play with Glenn Hughes, it was just like, well, it was amazing, you know, it was uh, I, just to have this, you know, from the, the worldwide phenomenon that is Deep Purple to have him ask me to, um, to do some shows with him and then later fly me to Copenhagen to, to record with him and Chad Smith on drums. And, wow. um, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was really, really amazing, and and then, but he's another one. He's like he reminds me of Billy Thorpe in a way. That uh, when I actually played live with him, it's like he's still he's in his sixties at the moment. Now I guess he'd be have to be the later half of his sixties. I'm not sure, um, but he um, he just seriously gives it his all. And I think maybe he even gives more than that, or maybe he even goes harder than he used to when he was younger because he's just got, I feel like, I reckon he feels like he has something to prove or something like that still, you know, and just, and just absolutely goes out there and kicks ass when, um, when he gets on stage. And I just, I just love that, you know, that energy that, you know, there's something, when you've got a front person that's just feet that has that energy, it's just like you can see it in the audience's faces. They just right. they just love it, you know. That energy just 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 passes straight onto the audience, and then it also comes back at you as well. The other musicians on stage, you know, and it's just this kind of chain reaction. And and so he's definitely a, a huge highlight, you know, of 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 people I've I've got to play with and um and record with. Uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of it definitely does come back to, you know, playing with Jimmy and Billy as well down here. Just, just incredible forces of nature, you know, and um, I think, uh, I don't know, I think Australian, there seems to be a lot of a, a lot of that kind of Australian attitude, you know, it does seem a little bit different to, um, to uh, maybe the rest of the world, you know, there's certainly a theme, I think, in, in a lot of Australian music and a lot of Australian frontmen to having that kind of just like all or nothing kind of thing. You know, I, I definitely think I've, I've picked up a lot of that in, in the way I perform yeah. and the way I go for things. And, you know, I, I do feel like it's sort of like all or, all or nothing, you know, I, I, I can't stand the thought of being on stage and anyone being bored for like one second, but like the idea of someone looking away going like, Oh yeah. Just, just that, that kind of thought just drives me nuts. So it's like when I'm on stage, I just want to be, I either want to be like incredibly energetic and exciting and, and, or I want to be like so sort of down and kind of sucking everyone into what I'm doing, you know, just really quiet and, or I want to be like really like high paced or really slow or, you know, it's just kind of, Oh, I find in my live shows that yeah, anytime it's sort of just cruising along, I get really sort of anxious and, and, uh, which is probably not a good thing. I think I've gotten a bit better at it the last couple of years to just let things, you know, let things groove and let things simmer. But I, I'm always afraid of that kind of, middle ground or that middle of the road kind of sort of thing, you know? So I'm always like, it's got to be big or it's got to be small. It's got to be super fast or super slow or super loud or super quiet or, or, or super just intense or, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. And I, I think a lot of that is, you know, a product of, of a lot of the artists that I've 
yeah. that have taught me and I've played with over the years. But that that's a really great point you make there because I said your your on stage um, performance is full on and and it's it's all or nothing. Um, is that something you get feedback on from um, your peers? So, and I mean this in a positive way, as far as because you give so much in your performances, do you get feedback from your peers, or I suppose on the not so positive, do you cop criticism from those that maybe don't put in as much effort on stage? Um, I cop criticism, uh, you know, on the internet, you know, from <laughs> various videos and stuff like that, where I'm. I might be, you know, off my tree, my hair's going everywhere, you know, and you'll get comments like, oh, just settle down or, or look at this, you know, look at this nitwit, what's he doing up there? This is not music. <laughs> what? I get lots of, yeah, well, I mean, I don't get lots, actually. I, mean, I don't really get too much no. too much at all, which is great, but, you know, every now and again, you you, you know, you, they're the ones kind of, unfortunately, you remember more than the, than the, than the praise. Um but yeah, as far as my my peers and the people I know, I think a lot of people probably think that, um, but they don't tell me, which is cool, yeah, <laughs> which is <that's> good. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm not stupid, you know. I, I think a lot of, I think a lot of people, I probably cop a lot of, you know, shit about the way I perform, um, and you know what I do on stage, and I think it, yeah, but I think any. That's what you. That's what you want. Mm. Like, you're never going to get any. You're never going to get anywhere if you if you just play it safe. And I think, unfortunately, that's yeah. You know, the session scene and stuff like that. Especially, I think a lot of session players find it hard to break out and do their own thing because they are very scared of what um, other people will think. Because it is pretty. It does get pretty narky sometimes. You know. You know, when you hear the way people talk about other people and and other artists when they're you know putting themselves out there, you know, and 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 yeah, it's a, you know I know that's what that that goes on to a certain extent, and it and that just scares people, you know. They're not gonna it stops people from putting themselves out there, and you you have to put yourselves out there. That's you right. have to put yourself out there if you're gonna um if you're gonna get anywhere, you know, and 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 when you do that. You are going to cop a little bit, but you know. Uh, also, also, you know, you're going to have the chance to, if you know, if it resonates with a whole bunch of other people, then you're going to open up all these opportunities to to do all this other great stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know why, but I, I've somehow never let that phase me too much. No, and, um, and... It, at, at times, at times it has, and and some people, some people that mean a lot to me have said certain things that have gotten me down you know every now and again but generally uh generally i don't see too much of it and and the stuff online doesn't doesn't bother me anymore uh yeah yeah luckily (laughs) i'm going to provide a bit of a theory on that and that you mentioned yourself that if you know a traditional blues musician may roll roll their eyes and you're obviously not just doing traditional blues and i'd argue that for those that are used to the more laid back approach there's some confusion on their part on your passion and approach to performance as being not, I don't know how you've got substantive in the way you play, but if you've only got to watch the way you play to go, there's plenty of bloody substance in there and there's the passion on top. And I think there's just that confusion between you can be passionate about what you do and full on in performance and still have a substantive, uh, you know, way to play. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, a certain amount of it is energy and sort of flair, but you know, I think it trans. What I'm playing still translates right. perfectly well, just um, like sonically on the records. But I guess also, you know, a lot of, a lot of the um, I've had a lot of success with videos and and online videos, and that's been a big part of how I've managed to um, grow my career. Mm. Uh, but a lot of those, you know, a lot of those clips. Well, I've got sort of two bags of, of videos that have done well. I've got the the ones that are short and just kind of like ripping solos, just chops and and um, you know and sort of mixed in with a bit of madness. You know they they do well, and and then um, I I can quite often cop a bit of stuff about those ones because 
you know, get weird comments like, oh, I bet you we can't play a slow song or I bet you can't do all this or you bet you can't, I mean, you can't do that or this or this or this or that. And it's, it's like, why don't you go and watch some other videos then and see if I can. That's right. <laughs> but it's, um, because there's plenty of, it, but the ones that definitely, you know, there's plenty of videos of me doing that stuff, but the ones that get a lot of the traction are, are the kind of crazy ones. So it's, which is cool, you know, because that's like a, I think of those videos as just like a, a, as a way of drawing people, getting people's attention, and then hopefully if, if it sort of resonates with them, then they'll they'll search out my other stuff and actually watch full songs and you know ones where I'm singing and and doing my and watch the whole show or something like that and you know and then when when they finally watch your whole show then they're like okay i know what this guy's on about now and and hopefully you you might win win another fan <laughs> that's right and i also love your comment about forces of nature so talking about billy and jimmy and um glenn hughes and, and so on and so one of the you're a bit of a force of nature but there's a second force of nature on stage with you well there's actually two but let's talk about the hammond first so i mean you're being quoted as saying in one of your own videos that no keyboard has the power of the mighty hammond organ now i actually fully agree and i've only played a hammond b3 i think two or three times but even i can tell why you'd say that but can you tell me why is a bit of an opposing viewpoint why don't other keyboards have that power what is it about the hammond oh i don't it's just I don't know. It's just like it's got a life, a life of its own. When you, well, I think just in the nature that the, with any organ to start with, that when you hold down the note, it keeps going. <laughs> and then the fact that they just they got this sound so right. I mean, they were trying to copy a pipe organ when they when they designed when when Lawrence Harris came with the idea for Hammond, but it ended up just being so much more. And I know it's just the way it produces the sound. It's just so fat, like it's so, when you push that key down, it feels like you're connected to it in a way that sort of no other kind of synthetic instrument, which it is, it's a synthesizer technically, mm. an organ, um, sort of really produces, it just, it's like a big thump and then, and then through the, through the, the Leslie speaker and the, all those valves, and and the way it's just it is just so it's like it feels like sometimes it feels like you've got a giant um, hammer, you know, at one of those playgrounds or something, and you're about to bang it on the thing <laughs> to try and get the to hit the bell up the top. It's just sometimes the that sort of instant clunk or that connectivity you get when you you hit you just hit a key, you know, just one note, you know, I can. I, I love the sound of just, just even one note, you know. It just seems like that's enough sometimes with with the Hammond. Whereas so many other keyboards, it's like, oh, no, I need to play, you know, I need to play a chord or, mm. um, um, you know, it's obviously a piano, you get the, the same thing because you are connected, but but a piano is an, is an acoustic instrument and um, the organ is synthetic and but I still get that same kind of feeling and then it just keeps going. You know, for as long as my I'm holding down those notes, it's just firing, yeah. firing at me. And then I can then I can just milk it, you know, with the draw bars. So many different ranges of expression with the draw bars and then the volume pedal, I can I can use that to swell in and out and then the Leslie bringing that, you know, from slow to fast. Um it, it is so dynamic and I think Oh, I think it's a real it's a real shame that there aren't more people playing it, and I, I think I know why. It's just that you know I was lucky. You know, I was lucky when my first experience of playing the Hammond organ was on a real one. You know, so I got that yeah. kind of like just whoa, what is this? It was amazing, and I think most of well, a lot of people. And it probably happens with piano a lot these days too, more and more. Um, is they're playing a fake one, you know? They're playing a, a patch, yeah. a, a patch on a on a synth, and through, you know, just through some headphones or a crappy amp or something like that. And it's like, oh, you know, you know, oh, let's play that song. Have you got an organ sound? Oh, yeah, I think so. 
and pull up some organ sound and they try and play with that and it'd be like the most horrible kind of experience having to play one of those fake organ sounds it just has no life to it you know maybe in context with everything else it, it sort of might sound fine in the scope of the song and the instruments but you the person playing it you're not going to fall in love with that at all like there's just no chance you'll just go straight back to a great piano sound if you got one on there um so you know i'd i'd love to if i was you know i don't know if i was more well off or i'd love to be able to set up something where it was like you could just get get these youngins you know experiencing the hammond organ like a real one or at least some of the really new ones but still through a leslie um just so that was their first experience with the Hammond, and they could they could experience that same feeling I had when when I first got to play one. You know, before I, I you know, for me it was always I played the real one, and then you know five or six years later, you know, I'd have to do some gig and have to play a fake one, and it was just like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> Even, okay. and even even when you're playing the best of the fakes, so like even uh, the clip I saw of you in Auckland when you were playing with Jimmy supporting Springsteen, you've got two Nords there, and and you can tell, and you even make a comment, I think, in the comments of the video, go people say, oh, it sounds great, and you've gone, yeah, it's all right, because it's compared to the B three, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's 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 a Leslie will go a long way, which is the special the, the special organ speaker. Yeah. That makes a huge, huge difference, you know. Um, that's the hardest thing to emulate. But, um, so when you play those noise through a real Leslie, you can definitely you can definitely get through it. But um, it's still as soon as you replace that with a with a with a good working condition Hammond organ, I should say. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, just absolutely. There's no comparison. It's just incredible. And, when, and you, you get that feeling all over again. <laughs> and that links directly to my next question, which is obviously you, you use a Hammond Live and um, it must be, I, I would think, a nightmare maintaining um, a Hammond nowadays on tour, but you, you're a sucker for punishment because you obviously have your whammy clav as well. How the hell do you maintain that stuff on stage on tour? <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. The Hammonds, so the one I have here in Australia, so um, it's a 57, but it's pretty damn robust, I tell you. Uh, it's only let me down maybe two or three times. Generally, it's just been something really, really simple, you know, like a like the valve's just gone or or just like one the wire's come off or, um, or sometimes I think it's the organ. It's not even the organ. It's actually like the the pedal that I've got to control the Leslie, that was the thing that busted. So those things were built so well. They really were, and they're so solid. And it bangs around in my van all day, you know, driving it here, there, there, you pull it out, bang, just works. So, um, but, you know, there are little things that go, go wrong from time to time, but quite often they're just little things that I can... I can either fix myself or I can live without for one gig. You know, it doesn't affect the whole, mm. doesn't destroy the whole thing. You know, it mean, means maybe one tone out of the draw bars might not be working or the percussion might not work, which is another feature, or the organ vibrato might not work or be sounding a bit weird or something. And, and generally, the bulk of it is still there. Um, the whammy clav, on the other hand, is a little is a little trickier. Yeah. Um, should I describe what the whammy clav is yes please do yeah so the whammy clav um which is the the keyboard i sit on top um with the big golf club sticking out the top of it is a um yeah it's an original uh honer d6 clavinet but um uh it's been modified so it's got a basically a whammy whammy bar a very similar design to a, a bixby whammy bar on a on say a gretsch guitar but inside the clavinet because it's actually a fully stringed, a fully stringed instrument, and there's different gauge strings for, um, you know, like it's got four different gauges of strings across the sixty strings, and uh, it's got two single coil pickups, and you can put in and out of phase. Um, so um, it's a, you know, it's a, 
in a way it's you know that's why it sounds so much like a, a guitar in a lot of ways it's got that similar kind of frequencies and and tone to it it just has a very different attack you know instead of mm. hitting it with your fingers it's more like striking it it's if you were to wear like some hard I don't know, some plastic gloves or something, and then just hammer the fretboard, I suppose, of a guitar. It might sound something similar to that. But, um, yeah, and, but I played clavinet, a lot of clavinet without a whammy bar for a long time when I had a band with my brother called The Hands. And um, I remember, I don't know, maybe 2012 or something, someone had, someone had uh, told me about this clavinet that had a whammy bar. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Like, clavinet with a whammy bar? And I was just like, are you serious? That sounds amazing. And and it always stuck with me. And I was like, so did I say 2012? I meant to say like 2002. Okay. I think I said 2012, but I meant, two, I meant 2002. Someone told me this. Um, and uh, uh, it always stuck with me. And, and, it was around that time I got the internet happening, got my first kind of computer at home. And I started, yeah, I started just sort of like trying to find information on this, on this whammy clav and couldn't find, couldn't find anything at all anywhere. And every few years I'd sort of have another look and yeah, nothing. And it wasn't until about 2007 or 2008, I saw, um, someone posted, I think it was posted on YouTube, um, some footage of George Duke playing uh, playing the, the, this Perspex whammy clav at one of his shows oh, yeah. back in like 1980 or something like that or, or late 70s. And I was like, oh my goodness, it actually exists. It's real. <laughs> it's a real thing. Finally, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I was, oh, and then I was like, whoa all right, I've got to find one of these things. I've got to, you know. And yet again, on the internet, can't find any info still, like nothing. Um, and then it was 2011 or something. And I, you know, because I just, I keep searching all the time. And I eventually came across, yeah, this company in LA called Kenrich, Kenrich Sounds. And he had bought, patent of the of the way or oh, i don't know or licensed it or something okay. and he'd started and he made uh i think a batch of about 20 or something like that of this system and i was just like instantly emailing like oh how do i get one of these i've got to get one of these and he's like oh you're you're gonna have to find a club on craigslist in america get it sent to me and i'm gonna put it in blah 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 send it to you um and i was like so i was looking and trying to work it. and then eventually he just emailed back and said oh look you could just buy one of the ones I've got here, you know? And I was like, awesome. And then he told me how much it was. And I, I screamed a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, but I was just like, you didn't know how determined I was. I had to have that thing. Like I just knew, I knew it was going to be my thing. You know, I just knew instantly I could already see what I could do with it. Which is, you know, um, before I'd even had it. Because I knew what a clavin is, you know, I knew everything about a clav. I just didn't have a mommy bar on it, but I was pretty certain I, I was going to be able to make it work. And um, so that came, and then I just, yeah, spent the next two weeks basically just playing it nonstop and recording and coming up with ideas. And and uh, yeah, now it's been, it's yeah, since 2012, it's been another basically another big part of, of, of my show, you know, along with the Hammond, the Whammy Club's always there. And um, it's, man, it's just so much fun. So and much it, fun that um, it wails as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely it does. And is the guy still in business? Like what's your redundancy plan when, um, if something gives up the ghost totally? Yeah, so he's still, I, I mean, he still might even have like, selling the original 20 that he made. I don't know, or maybe he's made some more. But, um, yeah, they're still, I'm pretty sure they're still on the website. You have to, you just have to have an original club, you know, to, yeah. and and then you have to install it, which is a, a fair bit of work. 
I think the scariest bit is sort of cutting through the harp, drilling into the harp of the actual keyboard, because if you kind of get that wrong, you're going to just going to stuff it up completely. So um, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit daunting, and it is, I guess, quite, you know, to find a good clav can be expensive, but if you've already got one, um, you can buy this system, I think, for maybe just over a thousand US. Um, but then you've got to, yeah, you've got to get it fitted. I actually, I've got, another system at home ready to go into another club when I find some time. And it's actually an original one. It's one from the first 15 that Buddy Castle uh, designed wow. in the uh, the late 70s. Yeah, so I've, I've had that for a couple of years now, just sort of sitting at home. So um, I am I am eventually going to in- install that. And uh, I probably will end up buying another new one, new system as well at some point. But... Um, yeah, I mean it's not actually rocket science. There's nothing, nothing too much no, to it. But um, man, it's uh, it really just is a whole another element to the cloud. And I'm sort of surprised that more people haven't haven't uh, taken it up. I guess it is very, it is expensive, um, and you know it comes with all the other hassles that having a you know a, carrying around a, a mechanical keyboard you know brings. So it, you know, it does break strings, and you have to tune it, and you know, and you know, I, I have much more trouble with the clouds than I do with the Hammond. So yeah. to your original question, actually, um, uh, yeah, it's, it it can be pretty tricky, and uh, with the clouds, you know, I have to carry the strings and pliers and and all sorts of stuff with me, um, and I have to take them overseas with me as well because the thing is so heavy. It's obviously, you know. I've got one of the, you know, maybe one of 20 in the world. So I can't hire one when I go overseas. I can't, if I put it in a flight case, it's too heavy to fly. Yeah. So for the last eight years, I've, I've been wrapping it in bubble wrap and just chucking it on the plane. Jeez. And, um, yeah, and it, most of the time it's all right, but, you know, one in every 10 flights, it comes out a bit battered and bruised and, or the keys are bent or broken or, you know, and, and, you know, it can take me quite a while to sort of get back into shape um, before the gig. And, uh, yeah, so you're just, just using this, this old gear, you have to become a little bit of a tech. and and uh, But that's cool, you know. It's, uh, I don't really mind it. You know, sometimes I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. You know, it gives me a chance to feel like I'm getting it back in tip-top shape again and, and um yeah, at the moment the club, club's um, the best it's ever been. I reckon at the moment I gave it a huge overhaul late last year. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's tricky, but yeah, I'm, I am surprised more people haven't taken it up because it is just bloody amazing. Yeah, so much absolutely. Fun. <laughs> and I'll definitely be posting some links to the videos, including I know you've done one showing under the bonnet um, of of it as well which is really interesting but i still don't think you're really putting in a full effort though lucky i think you really need to start cutting around two or three analog synths um i know you've you use uh, like you've got a mini moog and so on but i think you need to or even if you're going to support your country of origin maybe start cutting around a fair light would be good yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah i'll get the fair light the mellotron i think maybe the, the modular move would be would probably be, be, better, even, yeah. would be better than the, uh, the mission. yeah, maybe a Chamberlain as well, grand piano, um, roads, really, definitely. Yeah. Come on, I don't think you're <laughs> look, I would, I, I would. Well, Who wouldn't? one Who day, wouldn't? if you yeah, got, look, I'd, you know, one, someone setting it up for me <laughs> with the right number of roadies, it will happen. So, um, yeah, without a doubt, yeah, look, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to especially have a, I'd love to have a whirly or something as well. and but it's just, you know, it's just so much to set yeah. up already that um, maybe, I'm sure one day down the track I'll, I'll be able to do a slightly bigger setup. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think we've talk, covered gear pretty well, but I, I did notice from, yeah, I said your latest uh, uh, video clip covering one of your most recent releases, you, you, you're throwing a little bit of synth in there at times? Yeah, there's, there's, I think on the last few albums there's been a, there's been a little bit of the mood on there. We definitely, I definitely used the Moog a lot more when I was playing uh, with the hands. Use it quite a lot, and uh, and yeah, a lot of sort of synth-based stuff that I've done over the years. But I haven't done any of, 
actually on the last song I released, the very last one I did play the mood bass, which was cool fun. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try and get into a little bit more of that, I think. Um, now I've got a kind of cool studio set up that I can, I can play around a bit more, which is cool. Um, I just hope I never see you with a guitar, Lockie, but that might be just a personal preference. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Good man. Good People man. have been dying, dying for me to get on the guitar for absolutely years and years and years. And, and yeah, I, like, if that ever happens, you know, something, I've had some sort of breakdown. Yeah. So just <laughs> come and like, call. If you see me with a guitar, call me up and, and um, ask me if I'm okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, that's great. Um, <laughs> and Having doing... said that, I love I love seeing people with guitars. Though I do love seeing other people play guitars. So yeah. really, I'm you know they are awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and we're down to our last couple of questions, um, Lockie. As far as um, the biggest lessons you've learned as a keyboard player over what's now a, a pretty impressive gigging life. Oh, um. Okay, uh, I would say like maybe don't get for me personally, don't get bogged down on the um, on playing things exactly the way they are on the record, mm. or exactly the way someone has uh, has um, you know it, exactly the way it was recorded. You know, I've I think having to do that can be a little, you know, can stifle creativity a little bit, I think. Uh, I think uh, um, one of the things when I when I kind of finally realised, I think a lot of the way I play is a result of um, of finding it difficult to play um, things exactly the way someone else has has played it. You know, um, uh, I think I've been good at finding different ways to play something that has the same feeling or the same, the same kind of, um, intention and, and that kind of sparks new, new things, you know? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, if you can play, if you can play things exactly the way they're written, I mean, that's, that's, that's great. And that, that might come easy for you, but it, it didn't come easy for me. And that, it used to, it used to stress me out a lot until, I realized that it was actually because of that, that I was coming up with new ways of playing and, and new ideas and, mm-hmm. and, and creative things. And that, and I like, I mean, I like to think I have, um, a unique way of playing. Um, you know, it's always, as people will always remind you of, you know, that if, if they'll say that what you play reminds you of this or that or that and that, which is great too, which is a, is a compliment. But, um, I do, I do like to think that, from everything that I've done, I have sort of, and probably because of my limitations, I think, I think I have come up with, you know, something that sort of sounds like, sounds like me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I certainly hope so anyway. <laughs> so I, w- I would say if, if that's you anyway, don't get too stressed about that and try and try and turn it around and, and use it to your um, advantage. Yes. That would definitely be one thing. Um, uh, and I guess similarly, in a way to comparing yourself to other people as well, um, yeah, I, there's there's always going to be a million people out there that can do these incredible things that you can't do, and um, and that's absolutely fantastic. You know, you, you you shouldn't you know you shouldn't compare yourselves to them. You should just appreciate that, and and hopefully you can become something that. Uh, you know, is different and is uniquely you and, and yeah, I don't know. I think that's probably like the yeah. lessons I've learned and, and, you know, that's, I think that, that's kind of easier said than, easier said than done, yes. but um, okay. yeah. No, good, good, good lessons. And um, I think you've covered off beautifully your most memorable train wreck, unless you do have a more memorable one. But for me, it's hard to get better than, you know, Barnsley screaming, play the fucking song at you. But if you have got a better one, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I don't know if I've got a better one than that, but, you know, there's always, there's multiple 
funny ones because you know as as you know I, I do jump around a lot on stage so I I have had a lot of spinal tap moments over the years you know whereby you know like you you're doing your your quiet moment in a song and and you know I've, I know I I'm sort of working up to this like epic point in the song where I'm just going to jump up and and hit the scream on the highest note on the organ and 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 just start wailing and you know and and you know and the lights are the lights are dark because you're you're quiet and you're just you're just building this up and then sure enough it gets to that sort of peak and you jump up and you go for that note and then you know classically I've done it I've done it so many times it's like you just kick kick the lead out or something like that <laughs> or or on the Hammond bed you, if you, if you know the Hammond you've got these preset these black preset keys yeah. on the left. And um, yeah, and they're sort of like draw- settings for the draw bars. But if you accidentally sort of knock it, sometimes it'll it, all the keys will come up, which means none of the draw bars are engaged, and it'll just cut off the keyboard. And so many times, uh, I've, I, there's actually a few ones I could probably find on on YouTube where I've done it. Um, you know, especially when you like you, you play on a higher organ or something like that, and and it's actually like a little bit, it, it's more prone to doing it than say mine. So uh, I now take it down with gaffer, but um, those keys. Uh, but you know, you just jump up, and then you're like, it's your big moment. Here we go! It's, it's gonna scream! This is going to be amazing! And then, sure enough, nothing comes out, and you just like, and then you look over at the band, and they're just pissing themselves with laughter, and <laughs> and oh, I've done it again. But uh, yeah, I've had quite a few moments like that, you know, as you do when you. You know, or just mid solo when you're jumping around. Kick, kicking the lead out is definitely a a a, a, a common story. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. And um, and second last question: What's on the horizon for you in the coming year? Lucky, I know it's all a bit up in the air, but I assume you're hoping to get back out there again. And um, once it's safe to do so, and who knows when that is? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've had some of the the Aussie gigs postponed to to uh, I think around October. Um. Still, you know, I guess in a way they're still up in the air. I don't know. But for the meantime, that's the plan there. I've had a couple of the Europe festivals um, that I was meant to do this year, probably around about now, the next few months. Um, they've been they've been sort of locked in for next year. Uh, and, yeah, it's all – I'm starting to just book stuff for around this time next year, really. That feels kind of like – safe but I guess if anything changes I suppose there, there might be a, a mad dash to kind of to book stuff in um, but at the moment I'm just getting ready to release I'm getting to release a whole bunch of songs I recorded in December I, I recorded a whole bunch of covers that that uh, people have just been asking me to do for, uh, for ages and I've sort of I played a lot of them live and haven't recorded them um, and I thought well bugger it I'm you know I may as well just I may as well just yeah. do these great songs that that I love and and see what happens, you know. And uh, so I recorded uh, "Give Me Some Loving," which I've been doing for mm. since the words go, and, you know, in my in my set. And I've done "Wider Shade of Pale," nice. <laughs> and I'll light my fire. Um, and on the club, I've done "Voodoo Child," you know, all pretty obvious, but um, great. Great songs, nonetheless. You know, they're, they're obvious choices yeah. for a reason. And um, uh, yeah, there's another one in there as well. And oh, I did that version of Sleepwalk on the uh, oh, yeah. on the Wormy Cloud as well. Um, so I'm going to put that on there too. And so that's they're gonna, slowly going to be released over the rest of the year. And I'm still toying up with how to do that. Maybe a vinyl um, for the main release, but. Uh, yeah, and the clips, but the next one that's coming out is Give Me Some Love, and so that's coming back from last week in a couple of days. And that's, I've kind of set that one up as a big celebration of basically my 10th year anniversary of doing my own thing. And it's kind of fitting because I've been playing that song for 10 years, and um, but I've never recorded it properly. So the song itself goes for, well, the song with the solo, the long version, goes for almost seven minutes. And the radio edit goes for less than three minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you could do the math on the solo there. That's right. um, uh, so, um, yeah, basically the video clip I've made 
for, for Give Me Some Love is just clips of all the stuff that I've done, like as much YouTube footage as I can find over the last 10 years from all around the world. And I've just pieced together this big sort of, um, I don't know, retrospective, I suppose, of, of, of my career so far. And I've also got footage of so many of the guests that have come up and, and, and played with me and then all the various band members over the years as well. And then I've tried to find as much sort of footage of, of the crowd as well, you know, in all these festivals and put that in there as well, hoping that people can see some footage of themselves in there. And uh, so that's, yeah, that'll be coming out probably within a month. And so I'm excited about that. That's, that's what's happening in the next, uh, yeah. the next few weeks. That's anyway. amazing. And just as an aside, have you ever had the opportunity to meet Steve Winwood? I haven't, no. no. I would, That'd have to be on the I'd list, I imagine. I'd love to. Yeah. yeah, I remember I tried everything I could to, to when he came out with Steely Dan eight years ago or something like that. But, um, yeah, to, to no avail, unfortunately. No. But who knows, maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. And uh, to wrap up, it's our usual uh, Desert Island Discs question. So I, I was kind and gave you a heads up on this one. So five five um, albums that you absolutely couldn't live without. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I'm hopeless with albums. Um, I reckon one album that uh, would just would have to be top of the list as far as albums that uh, just influenced me a lot would have to be um, just Booker T's Green Onions, oh, yep. just that album. Um uh, I just, that was my first introduction to him. And, um, I think his, the, his, his feel, um, of the organ and just his touch and, it's, and the way he used the Leslie and everything was just, just magical, you know, even back then when he was, when he was really young. And, um, that's, that's a great album, uh, uh, you know, I haven't, I've got to say, I haven't listened to it for a long time, but um, I just remember just learning so much from that album. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of soloing going on there. So it's a really yeah. good way to, uh, and, and it's very, in a way, it's, in a way it's simple, you might say, but simple in the kind of, you know, just playing the notes is kind of simple, but all the, all the stuff that makes it beautiful is, is where the magic is, you know, all the grace notes and the, yeah. the draw bars and the swelling of the volume pedal and the Leslie. And I think anyone, I think it's a perfect album for someone getting into to playing the organ. Um, what would be another one? Um, I would say, I'm just going to say some weird ones that are coming to my head, but uh, an album that I, I still listen to all the time or a band that I still listen to all the time and, uh, and because I just, I, you know, I love funk music and I love, I love groove. So a big one would be um, the uh, the best of Parliament Funkadelic. Oh, yeah. yep. it, it was a double CD, a double CD set, and there's a Bernie Worrell playing all these incredible keyboards yeah. all over it. You know, um, not much organ, but great cloud and great moog and great piano. Really interesting as well. Um, he's certainly someone that's, you know. Uh, is not a typical organ uh, keyboard player at all. I think he's really, he was really out there and, and it was uh, yeah, really just super cool stuff. Um, uh, another one, probably like James Brown oh, yeah. uh, and the JB's volume, volume two. It was sort of like a best of, um, yet again, it's just the funkiest mix of tunes and, you know, uh, uh Incredible band. That was sort of like the later period of James Brown, you know, where he had like uh, Fred Thomas playing bass um, and he's playing a little bit of organ and, and piano. James Brown's playing a little bit of organ and piano on some of those tunes as well, but just the killer band, you know, killer horn section, Maceo and the, and, uh, and Fred. Fred, what, a, what an absolute demon. Um, uh, yeah, let's see, the meters probably that... Um, the first, the first kind of um, what was it called? Was it called Look a Pie Pie, or I'm not, I'm not sure what the actual album was called. It might have just been like introducing the meters or something like that. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think their first album is just oh, super cool as well. Super cool organ playing. Um, 
Uh, yeah, what's another one? You got one to go. That's right. And, so, and just to give you, while you're thinking, our last guest guest was Bonnie McIntosh, who's a keyboard player with people like Selena Gomez and Melanie Martinez, and and most of her five were things like Rage Against the Machine and um, stuff like that. So I, I'm I'm expecting for your last one, you'll come up with say I don't know, Pseudo Echo or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can tell you what my favorite record was when I was before I was even a keyboard player. Yeah. Before I was a keyboard player, um, when I was just a kid, my, my favorite record was "Bad Out of Hell." Oh, there you go. Well, there's some, there's some key, uh, there's some piano uh, on that. I still love it. Oh, it sure is. I, I've never even attempted to play it. No. And um, uh, but wow, what what songs and what what theater and, and just incredible. Hey, uh, really. Really amazing album. Yeah, I still, I still love that album. So yeah, whack that one on. Yeah, I, I, I like, like that. that. And and no disrespect intended to Pseudo Echo either. I'm I'm a major fan, but I just thought it was a nice um, contrast. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? They, uh, I think they're still going, aren't they? They are. They're still releasing. Pop up every now and again. Yeah, still releasing the old bit of new music. And I mean, Brian Cannon's essentially the only the only original member left, but um, they're very popular touring act still. So. Um, yeah. yeah, he's got, he's a bit of a bit of a key, key, key task. Well, he is, he is, he can be. That's for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But yeah, no, Lockie, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I, even though we've spent over an hour talking, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, and that's because of of what you do and the substance of what you do. And um, I know I've actually not seen one of your shows yet. So um, the sooner you can get back to Wollongong, the happier I'll be. Or I need to get my ass up to Sydney. Um. Very much looking forward to it. And you were a, a I think guest. we're, yeah. You were a I guest. I think we were booked to play, you know, it was the Heritage. So. Oh, the Heritage. Oh, I don't know don't... if that's going to um, eventuate later in the year, oh, hopefully. That, yeah, it doesn't get much better than that because you only, um, it only seats about uh, 50, 60, but it's a beautiful venue if you want to really um, enjoy an artist. Um, that's superb up there. Um, so yeah, I, I look forward to seeing. Yeah, you I haven't, I haven't, haven't been there in the flesh, but um, yeah, thank, thank you so much for taking the time. And and you were a, ge- a guest that a few of our listeners requested, so it was lovely to to nail you down for one. And um, yeah, we'll definitely um, keep in touch on what's a hell of a career. Awesome, yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. That was awesome fun. And there we have it. As you might have been able to tell, I enjoyed speaking with Lockie a great deal uh, and I definitely appreciate him taking the amount of time he did to speak with us. Um, yeah, that, that was a bit of a buzz. So the Keyboard Chronicles will be back again in a fortnight or so, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. Um, our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. We're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles or on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash the keyboard chr1. If you'd like good old fashioned email, then please do drop us a line at editor at keyboard chronicles.com. And I've got to say, on the email, it's been lovely checking in with people um, from around the world actually, just checking in on them and them checking in on us on how we're all doing in these interesting times. So, yeah, that's been a bit of a buzz as well. Um, So yeah, a huge thank you again to Lockie for joining us, but most importantly, thanks to you for listening and I hope to see you back here next episode.